Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching this in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. Well, it's Thursday, so we got a new uh, drop monitor update. And the way I wanted to show it to you, though, was by comparing it uh, using one of the tools on the drop monitor website to the drought monitor that we had back at the end of May. So what you've been looking at here is the drought monitor map from May 31st. The great thing about this tool is you can slide this slider bar over and see how the drought situation has changed since then. And as you just kind of go back and forth here, a couple things really kind of jump out. And the biggest, I think, for me is the development of drought throughout the southeast, the mid-south, and pockets of the Midwest, because this is the newest drought monitor we've got here. Now, when you look at this, just remember the data come out uh, every Tuesday. The maps are available to the public every Thursday, and it's a long-term drought indicator which means whenever there are big rains, um, even though that may temporarily provide some relief from the drought, uh, it looks at some longer term statistics. And on the flip side of that, flash drought isn't captured very well by this, but that's not by design. So it's not a criticism. It's just making sure we know what we're looking at here. So I want to talk about what got us there. I've been thinking a lot about this as of late, this pattern that we saw throughout the month of June featuring this trough that's been sitting here, a ridge that sat over parts of the Mid-South and the flow that kind of weakly came over the top of this. And that's what helped develop that drought. The flow here was kind of doing something like this. And as a result, we just didn't have the right jet stream flow. Uh, we kind of robbed the whole uh, area in through here of good momentum in the atmosphere. And, and the higher the momentum, the more regular the weather systems are, the better the chances are of it um, moving rather than getting stagnant. So what I want you to see is this is what the month of uh, June looked like. And this is how much things have changed since the beginning of July. Now, that may be kind of subtle in the differences, but this trough moved closer to shore. We busted up the, it's kind of like this omega block that was in place here. And what ended up occurring is we, a deepening of this. So what ended up happening with the flow is that came over this ridge through this trough, and then instead of being forced to run over a large ridge that was in the midsection of the country, we got more flow out of the northwest as of late coming around the base of this trough. All right. And what that did was that really just changed the whole precipitation pattern, uh, brought the faster winds back in, gave us better chances of, of the right kind of flow to make storms. So through midnight on Thursday, so very early this morning, uh, this is what the precipitation pattern looked like. And you can see there was some extremely heavy rainfall that moved through places, big hail in the systems in, in parts of Montana. Of course, we have the derecho event that went through parts of South Dakota, which also produced hail in addition to strong winds. That storm system moved across northern Iowa, no northern Illinois, and then we had flood watches out uh, here in I, uh, excuse me, Ohio, uh, where the rain came through. Big storms in the southeast as well. But when you look at the map again, the things I'm really trying to focus on is okay, rain came through. Yes, there was a lot of severe weather, but where did it miss? And you still see these large pockets in through here. Sorry, that uh, really missed out on some of this precipitation. Now, as of late, this is the last 24 hours. So there was a storm system early this morning that was out in Kansas and Nebraska, moved across parts of Missouri and southern Iowa, and then went right through Illinois. So you can see that since then, that filled in a hole that was in here that desperately needed some rainfall. I'm still on a vacation with my family right now, but I've been checking because I live in this little hole right here. And we needed that rain. And as you take a look here, we're pretty excited. We had some of that come through here had over an inch at home and we desperately needed that. But there are still holes that I'm trying to, to, to fill here. Now, when we think about uh, what this has done, I'm going to take you to some storm reports here. Uh, these were the storm reports from today on the 7th. So again, parts of Tennessee getting into the southeast. Yesterday, a lot of that was coming out of the Ohio River Valley right here in Kentucky, Indiana, and Ohio, and then spread toward the south and east. A lot of severe wind reports here from Virginia to South Carolina. Had some more hail and some absolutely beautiful storm structure out of Colorado and more big storms in Montana. In fact, Montana really has been the source region for a lot of these storms, especially the ones that came across and produced the derecho event on the 5th that went right in through this section of, of, um, of South Dakota. And remember, we knew that region had the risk, but it was the evolution of that storm during the day, which you can't forecast. None of the models nailed it. It's, it's a now casting situation. Uh, and we just kind of watched it really push across this area here. Thankfully, it did dissipate as it hit Iowa, but did a lot of damage in South Dakota. Remember, South Dakota was hit back on uh, May, I think it was like May 12th, May 13th with that system that came up from the southwest. Now, remember, before all this on the 4th of July, all of these storms were here and they were producing some large hail uh, in this part of Montana. But I did want to show you a couple things here. 
Uh, some of the storm st structure as of late was absolutely incredible. Uh, take a look at this one. This was a, just a beautiful picture here um, that just shows the leading edge of that squall line and the heavy rains that were behind it. Make sure I want to give credit to Nathan Erickson who took this. And then um, I put this picture in my report this morning, but it's quite important. You know, as we're trying to figure out how much damage was done to the crop, this was the day of when the corn was laid flat. But he said that the corn is starting to turn up in parts of South Dakota, meaning maybe there wasn't a substantial cell uh, destruction here or green snap. And again, the credit for that one goes to Carl Eliason. Uh, I really appreciate these folks putting this out here so we can see this. But we have also seen quite a bit of hail damage. And this is just looking at the maximum estimated hail size from uh, the 4th of July forward. So big storms racing through here, producing softball size hail in some of them. So we saw a lot of, just a lot of destruction out of this. Now I keep coming back to this map and this is uh, the last 30 days of precipitation as a percent of normal. And since early June, we have seen flash drought developing in Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, and surrounding states. It's been in the Southeast and the Carolinas. But the big areas that we've really been keeping an eye on are right in through this part of the Mid-South and then again through Texas. And Texas is probably the state that, I'll be honest, I'm most concerned about in terms of what this drought has done. We can look at some soil moisture data here from the 7th and, and see that same story. So you notice parts of the Mid-South getting into Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Arkansas. Look at the sides of uh, the western sides of, of Tennessee and Kentucky. Soil moisture was quite low when this was observed this morning. And then down here in Texas, quite bad. There are other pockets. Notice North Carolina uh, here in the western Corn Belt that are really missing out on soil moisture. Uh, and these are the areas that as we watch the precipitation evolve over the next five to six days, we need to see if those areas get filled in. So what's changing? Remember, we talked about this at the beginning. How are we continuing to see this pattern change? Well, by the weekend, the ridge that was here today has moved its way all the way to the four corner states. The deeper troughs have been off the west coast. Well, we're now seeing those troughs retreating closer to Alaska. And the flow comes around, dives, runs over that ridge, and we do continue to get in the near term some northwest flow. But this is going to be a bit different. In other words, to get this northwest flow coming in from that trajectory rather than being a bit flatter, remember we talked about this on Monday, that's actually going to start to introduce some drier air at some point. As we play this out, let's go all the way out there to next Monday, getting out to next Tuesday and Wednesday, we see even deeper troughs forming here. So this is a highly amplified pattern, as you can see here. This is going to bring in some cooler weather, but much drier weather. This is not the type of setup that brings in a lot of thunderstorms in the Midwest, just as an example. And what it does is it returns quite a bit of heat east and keeps the heat in the plains while the eastern part of the country sees some cooler weather. That's going to be a mainstay of the second part of what I want to tell you about today. The other part of this is what are the bigger picture things that are going on right now that are controlling the longer range weather? Because I like to do that kind of in the middle here. The MJO has collapsed. We didn't expect it to come way out here, but it's, it's back now in forecast to go into null space. And part of this is because La Nina is kind of back on center stage for being the more dominant factor. The trade winds, as you know, we like to look at this Hovmuller diagram, remain quite strong through the middle of July. In fact, probably into the third week of July. And this La Nina just continues uh, to kind of barrel forward. So stronger trade winds, remember, that's the true uh, defining feature of the La Nina. The ocean temperatures are the symptom of those stronger trade winds. And we talked recently about the warmer water uh, that's showing up here. That's just because we don't have much colder than normal water below it to really up well and keep these temperatures cool here. But just thinking about this, there's a couple of things I want to talk about. Nothing in the tropics right now that we need to think about in the Atlantic, but the water here is still warm. And Colorado State University uh, updated their long-range seasonal forecast and l made no changes. Uh, they were very consistent. Uh, if an average season has 14 to 15 named systems, they're calling for this one to have 20, about 130 to 140% of normal overall. But let's just see what's going on with this and start to ask ourselves about the bigger pattern going forward. Because I presented this many times, even though we saw this breakdown in early July, relieving some of the drought pressure, it hasn't removed it off the table. And we know that in July and August, during those years when we had La Nina events that were as strong as this one or stronger, this is where we really missed out on the precipitation right in the middle part of the country. Those years did not see extreme heat in the West. Uh, they saw better precipitation up the East Coast and at times even better precipitation across the South getting into Texas. And we'd love to see that. But um, this is the area that I'm most concerned about. 
So released a little while ago is the new European weeklies. And, and just as we talked about, I told you, I don't know if that was last Monday or the Thursday before, but there was that kind of buyer beware sentiment I gave you. I'm like, hey, I, I think the model was just initialized too wet. And now we can see that going from July 6th to August 6th, that it's gone over dry in the middle part of the country. I mean, can you see how this is almost just a copy of that, you know, history? That's what it's doing. And as we play it forward, it really wants to, through the end of July and start of August, give us a higher chance at seeing a repeat of drought in this area. So why don't we take this out and, I don't know, I'll stop it on August 20th. How about that? And if we go out there, we just see that this area from July 20 to August 20 continues to show up with risk. Why is it wetter in the southeast through the east coast? That's not hurricane development. What you've got here is the model just seeing more boundaries sitting in this area. One coming around this ridge, another one coming around the Bermuda High. They just sit and meet here. Active southwest monsoon. This story is really playing out. Now, I want to make sure I'm very clear about this so that it doesn't seem like there's a bias. Why did this go over so dry? Well, the new forecast, the near-term forecast, what the model was initialized with, is now drier here. So see, that's the flip-flop we get out of these things. But I'm going to take this a step further and go even farther out because on the 5th, we did get some new long-range data. I put it in my morning reports, but we need to have a discussion about it. It begins with La Nina. Now, you know, we've talked about this. All of these models really over-predicted, except for NOAA's models, uh, the fading of the La Nina. It didn't. It stuck around. And the new ensemble average keeps it somewhere in this vicinity, which means going out to this early winter will likely have either enso neutral conditions or weak La Nina conditions. That's the current uh, ensemble average forecast here. I can show it to you another way. I pulled this off of the Bureau of Meteorology out of Australia, BOM, and we looked at it uh, last month. But it's the Australians, the Canadians, the Europeans, the Japanese, the, uh, the French, the U.S., and the U.K., and the average looking at those central Pacific Ocean temperatures. So we're just asking the question, uh, is La Nina going to keep going? So there's July into August, September, October, and November. And now the two groups that are most aggressive are the Canadians and the British. <laughs> but you can see that all of the longer range forecasting centers are not predicting any sort of El Nino development through fall uh, and, and probably getting into winter. So that means this picture where we have the cooler waters here is going to continue. Now I'm going to show you what that means though, because as we go from July into August, September, October, November, we'll just keep going out here to, to January. That seems to be fading maybe midwinter, but it's still staying right there on the equator and a bit south. The warmer plume of water seems to be in place. And if we go back here, let's just take you back to September. I did notice that we saw some cooler water in the main development region. But one of the big reasons for that, though, is because during that three-month time period, the model is predicting an, Af an active African monsoonal season here, producing a lot of systems that roll across the equatorial Atlantic, roll really in the heart of where we build hurricanes, bringing that moisture into the Caribbean and then into the Gulf of Mexico. So we look at that and say that this would be another... Um, uh, results of the La Nina, another indicator that we could have an above average hurricane season. And if you keep that Bermuda high, you know, right in place, right in through here, that could push these systems closer to the United States. We need to keep aware of that. Real quick, looking around the world, South America, we do see dry conditions in southern Brazil and in Argentina and Paraguay and Uruguay. Uh, most of Australia is quite wet through this, and that's very typical when the Indian Ocean is in its current negative phase of the dipole and La Nina. But I want to take you to Europe first and show you that their July, August, and September forecast uh, is looking quite dry. There it goes. Sorry, I'm tethering off my phone, so this is as fast as I can get up here. Uh, very dry uh, compared to normal. Models just really came in quite aggressively dry. Uh, and as a result, we're concerned about the total productivity out of Europe. If we go from there over to uh, an Asia-centered map, active Indian monsoon really pulling a lot of moisture into where they grow a lot of cotton, but the monsoon has advanced all the way to Pakistan. Uh, it only looks dry in like Nepal over to Bangladesh, part of the Ganges River Valley, but a lot of the big ag is in the central and southern part of India, right in through this corridor. China is interesting. We still see drier conditions being forecast for summer along the Yangtze River, but it's wetter around the North China Plain and the Manchurian Plain, which would mean this is where they're going to grow 
uh, most of uh, a lot of their crops um, in this area for corn soybeans just thinking about those two crops specifically but what we need to do is come back to the united states and this is the new july august september outlook all right that's precipitation anomalies let's just walk through this quickly ready this is now when we step forward every step we're just going to lop off one month and add another one let's see if we can get that to work there you go that's august september october look at it build in that telltale la nina dryness in here then we go into september october november look at the northwest already seeing an early start to their wet season that's also very typical of la nina that's october november december and november december january and that map right there is la nina to the t now please understand that all of this is speculative it's based off of ensemble averages and it's based off of a few driving factors la nina is the biggest which means if we get that wrong none of this will verify but it's the latest data so we have to take a look at it i would like to come back to that summertime look and show you the temperature pattern we are expecting uh, so let's do this these are temperature anomalies and you can see where we're seeing the risk of dryness again from texas through the central plains getting into the corn belt um, that's what, where the models are really kind of honing in on the risk later now we could see the pattern break it down again that, ha that happens all the time what this tells you is that the, the risk has not been taken off the table just yet for summer uh, drought development. All right. We also got this today, brand new NMME data, and their forecast for August, September, October, so July is not included in this, really brings in a lot of Midwest, upper Midwest risk for being drier, Northwest, and down in Texas. So we just need to compare, uh, but this is just another look, and I'll spend some more time analyzing this once I get home uh, just to make some better sense of the NMME but I wanted to show you the data today okay we've got to get moving here because the near-term forecast includes severe weather flash floods and a lot of excessive heat south from Texas to southern Illinois all the way over to um, you know North Carolina and if we look this is where our, we're still seeing the risk of severe storms today Montana just this whole stretch right in through here down to Missouri through Tennessee, Kentucky, all the way to North and South Carolina. The setup is pretty interesting to see. The ridge is still sitting here, and the flow's coming around it like that. That's where those ridge riders are. We have these lows that keep coming through the eastern Canada, and they just bring in fronts. And this front just stalled out right in through this area. There's a high here, and that's pushing that flow in this direction as well. So all along that corridor is where you get your storms, and that's that, that ring of fire setup. Take note that while we do have a system in the East Pacific, uh, here across the Atlantic, no waves to be seen. So that's why it's quiet for the next five days. So looking at some satellite imagery, just as the sun was starting to set today, and we can see those storms, big storms popping right in through here, throughout the plains. Some of these hailers, I mean, they're doing a lot. And the risk uh, of seeing more severe storms in Montana is high tonight as well. As we go forward from today, uh, looking at uh, the 8th, that's where we have the risk for strong to severe storms. And then finally getting into the ninth on Saturday. Once again, Montana, North Dakota. This stretches into Saskatchewan and uh, Manitoba as well. Let's go take a look at it real quick on the high res NAM. And we're going to start this about 7 o'clock tonight. So what you're going to see is remember where those boundaries were. That's where the storms are going to continue to form. I cannot use this model and tell you if there is any early indicators of another derecho event. That's not possible. Um, we have ideas, but I, I can't do it with any certainty. So as we play through Friday into Saturday, that's what I've been rocking back and forth on. We just see that those storms are pushing farther and farther to the southeast. And that's because a front tries to come through and clear some things out here and bring in a little bit cooler air for the weekend for parts of the Midwest. But quite stormy through here through Sunday. From that point, we got to let our GFS on the left and European on the right take over. So we've seen through Thursday, getting out there to Friday now through the day on Saturday and into Sunday. So let's start right here, Sunday morning, 7 a.m. As we go forward into the afternoon and evening hours on Sunday, first big front clears, another shortwave moves through the upper Midwest, making some storms in this area. We then will see going into Monday morning, Monday afternoon and evening, the tail end of that next front still sitting in this area and just scattered storms over the southeast. And I, I'm really focusing in on here on the European model. It's been doing better as of late. This is now getting into Tuesday afternoon and evening. A lot of scattered storms in the south. We, we really just focused a lot on that, or the southeast, excuse me. But then as we get into next Wednesday, next Thursday, and Friday, you notice a big section of the country here has higher pressure, cooler weather, but drier weather. 
So if we look at the next seven days, these storms came through today. The fronts sag through the southeast over the Appalachian Mountains down here toward the Gulf Coast. We see the system still rolling through the upper Midwest, but there's going to be some large areas initially that are dry, and then this whole area goes drier later on. Why that happens is because by day 10, the jet stream's doing this. And that flow coming almost out of the north is telling me more about the drier that's coming in here than those ridge riding storms that feed into the moisture. So this is too much, too deep of a trough in this area to make that happen. So that's why the week two precipitation pattern looks like this. You now see the drier air. What's important to do though is to ask what the temperatures are doing during this time. And we're going to do that and finish this one up. So let's start off with today. Here's Thursday's highs. We've already experienced these. There's Friday. There's the cooler air coming in behind that front. You get just south of it. We're triple digit. Heat coming back into the northern and western plains. Going into the weekend. Here's now Saturday. Watch the heat come back into the plains on Sunday. That's triple digits from southern Texas all the way up to parts of north central Nebraska. The cooler air with the fronts. Okay, remember the storms coming over here. That's what's keeping things cool. It's cloud cover and rain. Monday, heat comes back into the west. Tuesday, the next weak front comes through in the northern part of the United States, but still very hot in Texas. And going forward into next Wednesday, this is how the temperatures shape up. My biggest concern I stated at the beginning across the whole U.S. is the Texas drought issue. Let me shrink that up so you can see it because NOAA just released this map this afternoon. It says from the 15th to the 21st, moderate risk of excessive heat down here. Okay, that's the 15th and 16th multiple waves of it coming through because of the bigger ridge building into this area. So let's look at it. We'll wrap this one up. Five day sliding window of temperatures. Okay. As we play this out, notice there's no real significant relief of the heat in Texas. And as we get out there at the, you know, late next week, the ridge is building in the West. So day five through 10, which gets us out to the 17th. So this, you know, this is the 13th through the 17th. Now you can see the position of that ridge. See the cooler air East that's in that trough but it fills back in. And as we work our way into the third week of the month and start to think about later in July, the heat comes back on and this is the area that we saw drier. So now we start to understand that longer range forecast. I'm going to keep analyzing this all weekend. I'll monitor it, put it in my reports in the morning for change, but I'll produce another video for you on Monday night with the newest updates. Really appreciate your attention and I'll talk to you then. Thanks.